it is the fourth week of art fight so you know what that means it is time to queue up that really long youtube video you've been putting off get something to hydrate yourself and do some wrist stretches baby because we have less than one week left to get all of our art fight pieces in and i certainly have been doing my best i have surpassed my previous record of five drawings in one week and instead made eight art fight pieces this week which is a lot for me so let's get into it for the first character feature in this video, we are doubling down on Calliopes. This is Calliope for Iron Duck in response to their friendly fire on my Calliope. This year, Iron Duck has been making these beautiful color shift potions of people's character designs, and all of their work is just so lovely. Not only is their potion making lovely, but also their character creation, because I absolutely adore the concept behind Calliope. Calliope is a centaur druid, however, instead of being a traditional centaur, which with a horse body, she has horns, scales, and a dragon-like body. Iron Duck also put in little notes in the character description of how Calliope likes to bask on warm rocks in the sun and likes to eat little bugs, and she's like a lizard and I find it just so endearing. Calliope's existence in the D&D world is very new, so she has a whole world of shenanigans and adventures, but mostly shenanigans she has yet to get up to. But Iron Duck has provided me very kindly with a little insight into Calliope's backstory. Calliope was essentially raised by the forest, so her social skills are not exactly standard. She's considered to be very beastly by most humanoids who interact with her, and if you somehow happen to be in Calliope's D&D party and are watching this video, uh, hopefully I'm not about to share spoilers, but, and Calliope herself doesn't know this, Calliope wasn't born with her reptilian features. She was actually a perfectly normal human child who was handed over to a cult leader by her own parents, and through some strange rituals, she was transformed. With this drawing, I really struggled with the placement of the right arm, which is unusual. Uh, once I get my sketch in and start putting in flats, I typically am pretty committed to the pose, and I rarely change things after the fact. However, this time, this was not the case, and I completely brought the arm from the back to the front. I do think it's better this way. Besides, it means I get to show off more of her pretty uh, claw nails, which I think are just fun. Another very fun detail that I like are Calliope's horns. So a lot of horn designs out there are like cow horns or goat horns, which, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Honestly, all of my characters with horns are that way too. But I love Iron Duck's take on this to do a sort of stacked, spiked, almost shell or coral looking formation. I think it's really, really pretty and a definitely a more unique look for horn textures. And I feel like I don't get to see uh, variances in horn textures very often, so it's so it's nice. And now for what is probably the most satisfying to watch part of this particular speed draw, adding in all the little scales. It's just an oval shaped brush in a gradient of blue and teals from darkest to lightest. Unfortunately, I erased the little spines on her back and, and this is very embarrassing because I only just realized it. I completely forgot to add them back in, which I apologize very deeply for. I genuinely did mean to bring those back. I I think there's such a cute detail, but alas, uh, I did not, and it's been up for a while, so. Even with that very embarrassing and unfortunate mistake, I do love how the drawing of Calliope turned out. She's such a beautiful character, and I wish her many wonderful D&D adventures and very few scheduling conflicts. Thank you so much to Iron Duck for yet another wonderful year of art fight exchanges. Iron Duck can be found on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, and Toy House. The links will all be below. They're a very kind and wonderful artist. Please do consider stopping by and checking out some of their work. So for character number two, I am nothing if not predictable because I immediately gravitated towards just a gremlin's D&D character, Ryladir or Rel. Rel is a kobold artificer and I just, how could I not draw him? Especially when Gremlin put in his character description that he's a lizard, a uh, dungeon meshy chillchuck. Plus it seemed only fair to exchange a kobold for kobold as they did a fantastic job of drawing my little banana kobold, 
thing. At the start of the video, you saw me redraw the base pose like three or four times because I, and I think I've said it before, Cobalt Anatomy just isn't as much my strong suit as I wish it were, especially since I love a good kobold. Uh, I did eventually settle on this cross-legged pose where Rel has his little satchel bag in front of him and he's working on fixing or upgrading his mantis steel defender. And yes, I did very intentionally place the bag in front of him because I couldn't be bothered to use my brain cells to figure out how digitigrade legs look when a creature is sitting cross-legged. But it looks super good and it works super well, so I'm not sorry at all. Just a gremlin went out of their way to send me some lovely insights into Rel's backstory and the campaign setting, and it sounds incredible. It's a party of six, and I should already be apologizing for any character names that I mispronounce, not just here, but for the entire video. But there is Rel, the kobold artificer, Cardithus, a furbolg paladin, Damien, a half-orc fighter, Tyreek, an earth genasi barbarian, and Raymari, a human monk. Which sounds like a really fun party composition. Obviously, I don't know subclass details, but it does sound like a lot of martial kind of frontline characters. This team is gonna have some damage behind their attacks, and as someone who primarily wants to play a support spellcaster, I love to see that in a party. But more specifically about Rel. Rel is from Mechanor, a very grand, flying, steampunk style city, which of course must be home to some of the most skilled artificers in their trade. After all, Mechanor is known as the artificer capital and boasts one of the two largest magic academies in the world. The academy on Mechanor is unsurprisingly for artificers, and it is in direct competition with the other magic academy, which is for wizards. Consequently, there is a lot of hatred and rivalry between wizards and artificers, each believing that their way is better than the other. Rel comes from a family of tradespeople, and the family emblem can be found on many artfully made items, including some of his mother's work. Rel's mother is a very well-known blacksmith around Mechanor. She even made the spear that Rel takes with him on his adventures. Growing up around the smell of molten metal, watching enchantments being carefully inscribed, and in a city of gears and steam, it's only natural that Rel becomes an artificer and continues to work incredibly hard to eventually be accepted in the prestigious Artificer Academy on Mechanor. Altogether too quickly, I'm already out of time for talking about this wonderful character, but once again, thank you to Just a Gremlin for creating just such a, such a fun little guy. I had an absolutely wonderful time drawing and learning about Rel, and I'm super pleased with how this drawing came out, with all the little metal bits and his overlapping scales. I think Rel is adorable. And if you too want to draw or just look at a bunch of funky fresh characters, do check out Gremlin's art fight page. Seriously, like all of the little guys in their character list are just, oh, moi chef's kiss. It is so good. All right, so for this one, I am going to apologize in advance because I love this character. I love the design. I love the color palette, but I did not fully record the process. I missed a huge chunk in the middle where I thought I was recording and I wasn't, and then that was followed by me immediately thinking I paused the recording when I didn't, and I'm so deeply sorry because Crows of Autumn's character, Zeher, which I'm also probably not pronouncing correctly, so I will also also apologize for that. Crows of Autumn, you deserve so much better. My super spicy fun brain was going through it that day, and I do distinctly remember that day specifically, because I was waiting for a pitcher to fill with water, but it was taking so long because my drinking water faucet is super duper slow, and so I said, oh, I'll set like a five minute timer and go draw this character and then come back to it, and then I got so absorbed with the drawing and didn't set the timer, and I just let the water run for like 40 minutes, and on the bright side, the water was coming out in drops by that point, so it could have been worse, but on the downside, I accidentally flooded my kitchen counter and had to take everything off to clean it, and then came back to my drawing to realize I was recording the dead space while I was cleaning the counter. Genuinely, I'm so sorry. I want to pretend I'm better than this, but I gotta be honest, this is the second day in a row that I flooded my own kitchen counter. I'm just trying to apologize and over-explain myself because I literally don't know how else to get through life. I don't 
don't know how I get through life. Anyways, nobody should have ever given me any kind of college degree, let alone an engineering one. But enough of embarrassing myself on the internet, let's focus on Zeher. What an absolutely fantastic character concept. So this is a homebrew modification of the Bloodhunter Lycan Order subclass, but instead of turning into a were-rat or werewolf, Zeher turns into a sort of dragon-like creature. Crows of Autumn proposes the idea of a group of five highly skilled warriors of Tiamat, the very iconic five-headed dragon from D&D, and each of these warriors take part in a ritual at a very, very young age where they are tattooed with dragon's blood and their hearts are replaced with dragon hearts. Zeher's heart was replaced by the heart of a black dragon, and obviously not many children are able to survive the ritual, let alone the transformation that comes as a result of the ritual. However, Zeher either luckily or unluckily did endure. The five surviving warriors of Tiamat were then tasked to each retrieve various artifacts. Zeher's search led him to an old temple, but as he was escaping with the artifact, the temple collapsed on him, leaving him with no memory of who he is, where he came from, or what the artifact is for. Isn't that nuts? Isn't that amazing? I love people's brains so much, and I love the opportunity to draw a character mid-monstrous transformation. I love purposefully creating horribly funky, uncomfortable anatomy, and the fact that a green glow is the cherry on top is just such a treat. Also, my partner specifically said that this drawing is his favorite one of the week, so Crows of Autumn, you get a bonus of having his extra special seal of approval as well. So here we are at the end of drawing number three. I'm sorry the whole intro was about me and the broken circuitry that I call a brain, but what an incredible story to go along with an equally incredible character design. I'm not gonna lie, I was very intimidated to draw for Crows of Autumn because he has such a cool art style and I did not at all feel like I was living up to the Ziola art that he made for me, but maybe I can make up for that by saying please do check out his other fun characters on Art Fight. I put his links in the description. It is very scary online for artists right now, and showing a little love and support is completely free, so let's not be frugal with our kindness. Number four. I actually planned to draw this character for Brunilla last year, but then at the last second swapped to a different character, so I was happy to see that Des Asphodel was still listed on their art fight profile. Keeping the D&D character streak going for this video, Des Asphodel is a wood elf grave domain cleric, and even though all the campaigns with my clerics are either on a very long and or permanent hiatus, and I am currently playing a paladin, I will forever be a cleric main. So when I saw this cleric with layers of flower symbolism and a tragic, heartbreaking backstory, I knew I had to draw her. Also, if anyone else is chronically on Pinterest looking for cool dynamic action poses and you recognize this pose in particular, uh, you know what? I was gonna say no you don't, but honestly, dynamic pose hard and sometimes I cannot achieve my vision with my brain cells alone. Brunilla has written a lovely short story of Des As Fidel's call to action and her journey to becoming an adventurer and cleric. If you want the full version, it is in Dez's character description on Art Fight. It is a very fun read, but it is a tragic story of Dez's simple, peaceful family of farmers in a small village surrounded by daffodil fields, a village that ignores the haunting warning signs of an impending catastrophe. On the winds of an unusual storm, a necromancer lays claim to the village, ending the lives of the citizens only to raise them again to fight as part of his undead army. Dez is helpless to stop the disaster and she watches as everyone she knows and loves turns. In a last effort cry of desperation, she begs for someone, anyone to take pity and stop the horrible calamity that has befallen the village. And someone does here. A bright light breaks through the storm, the horde collapses, leaving everything silent and still. And this was Dez's first glimpse of her new deity. I said previously that Dez has several layers of flower symbolism in their character design, and I love symbolism in a character design, so you know, you know I'm going to English teacher style overanalyze every last bit. So let's start with the character's name. Her last name, Asphodel, is a thin petaled white flower that in Greek mythology symbolizes mourning and death. However, Des Asphodel sounds kind kind of similar to Daffodil, a flower heavily featured in her backstory and also her character design alongside lilies. Now what do daffodils and lilies symbolize? Rebirth, renewal, and new beginnings. So now stay with me here. We have Asphodel, a lineage doomed to mourning and death, but with the addition of Des, we can still cling to the hope of a new beginning and a new dawn and bloom even after a cold.
cold, harsh winter. Okay, okay, I told you I'd be looking way too deeply into it. I mean, there's so much more I could unpack. Her deity taking on the form of a moth, the scythe from farming to serving justice. It's, it's a lot that I unfortunately have run out of time to talk about, but you can go lurk on Brunella's art fight page to overanalyze characters because a link can be very easily found below along with a link to their card which in turn has links to all the many social medias that they can be found on. Thank you so much Brunilla for stopping by my art fight page again. I am so happy I could revenge your work. So for piece number five of this week I finally break the streak of D&D characters and honestly sort of break the streak of the entire vibe of characters I've done for the majority of art fight this year. Just a warning this piece does feature bright neon colors and some minor weird uh, body horror goings on, so if that's not for you, feel free to skip ahead. This is Surrealism's finest character called Surreal Thing. There are two character designs listed under Surreal Thing. There is Sarah, a teenager living in a post-apocalyptic zombie infested world. Sarah does her best to maintain a routine in the shambles of the world they once knew in order to keep sane while having to be constantly aware of what's going on around them. But things are a little different as a result of world events. They have developed plant powers and the ability to let butterflies out of their skin, which helps a lot when it comes to keeping a garden full of food, which is super useful, probably one of the top three most useful things in the event of a horrible zombie apocalypse. Um, I would say number one most useful things in the event of a horrible zombie apocalypse is a power that Sarah doesn't know they have, which is a subconscious control of the zombies, which is why Sarah is able to coexist in the same house as their zombified mother. Now the second design listed under surreal thing is the actual surreal thing, this butterfly monstrosity which Sarah has a recurring nightmare about turning into. And the whole design process behind my sort of half Sarah, half surreal thing is a mixture of three oddly specific things. Number one is art done specifically of Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, depictions of her holding her heart uh, which has seven swords pierced into it, which is exactly how I wanted to have the hand placements of this drawing look. Number Number two, I think is probably the most obvious, it's concept art for Clickers from The Last of Us, a very popular zombie franchise where it's not just zombies, but zombies as a result of mushroom and fungal growth. So you have a lot of blooms coming out of people, which very much aligns with the butterfly wing shape. And the last source of inspiration is the animated movie Paprika, which is about dreams. There's a ton of butterfly imagery and weird, very colorful imagery as a whole. And with their powers combined, I have made this. One of my favorite details in this entire drawing that I just want to point out because I, I don't know, I think I did a cool job at it. In the original artwork, the tears of Surreal Thing are this dark inky color and I wanted the tears to streak down the butterfly wings in such a way that it looks like it's starting to uh, color and fill out the veins in the butterfly wings. It's a very small tiny detail but I really like it. I just think it's neat. And with that I get my unique mystical creaturey character of the week in. No, but this is a very emotional piece and character so I'm very touched that Surrealism's Finest had faith in me to be able to capture so much depth in such an important character to them. Thank you so very very much Rumi and of course they managed to draw a second of my characters just as I was finishing up my first revenge for the IO piece they drew me. But if you want to see more of their work, their art fight link is in the description along with their Kara and their YouTube channel. They have some animated shorts and an animatic so do go stop by and check some of their work out. Now immediately back to the D&D character comfort zone. Honestly I didn't realize while I was drawing that five out of eight characters I drew this week were D&D characters. We have a druid, an artificer, a blood hunter, a cleric, and now we have a ranger. That's a whole D&D party right there baby. This ranger is courtesy of Anime Panda as a revenge for the amazing meme drawing of Io and Glee Free, her sheep that isn't really her sheep but it's her sheep now. But on to the character. Meet Sariel Xylosient. Again, I, I pro I'm probably pronouncing every fantasy name wrong in this video, but it's on brand. Sariel is a fall Eladrin ranger who met her party while investigating a rot that was infesting a cave slash dungeon 
dungeon in the Feywild. And from there, there's just, there's so much drama and adventure. Sariel is trying to bring the party to the Queen of the Unseelie Court so that she can send them back to the Material Plane. There's magic books, different face cities, they meet Lolth at some point, they almost got TPK'd by a guy in a fortress surrounded by darkness, they manage to get out of the Feywild where there's scrolls and swords and scavenger hunts for artifacts, there's teleportation to some mountains, and get this, those mountains are in Shadowfell. This party does a lot of plane hopping and a lot of divine vibe checking, I mean divine sense, which honestly same, I am constantly popping divine senses with my paladin and anime panda. Divine vibe check is entering my vocabulary immediately. I don't think I'll ever stop thinking about that. If you want to read a more in-depth version of the story, anime panda actually has a link to Sariel's toy house page, which has detailed notes, character stats, and inventory list. And the inventory list is where I found out what was around Sariel's neck. In the original character reference, there's an indication of some kind of something around her neck and since I lady split chinified Sariel's entire outfit I wanted the necklace not tucked into her shirt but I didn't want to make up a pendant of some sort in case it was important and lo and behold in anime panda's wonderfully kept equipment list it noted that the necklace is actually a compass a compass that is a family heirloom it's a wondrous item that magically points to the nearest portal to the Feywild within a 10 mile radius unfortunately rendered it completely useless for the majority of Sariel's life as she was in the Feywild <laughs> so she was completely unaware that it was magical but nonetheless kept it near and dear to her heart. My favorite detail of this drawing is the little white hilt of a dagger in her right boot. It was a little detail in the original drawing that Anime Panda made that I just could not ignore. It's so simple so small it's just a single painting stroke but I don't know a knife in boot it's such a fun character personality indicator. But the sun sets on our drawing of Sariel. I love her warm color palette and in general I'm such a sucker for Feywild characters. Major thank you to Anime Panda for designing such a fun character. It was an absolute pleasure coming back to revenge your work this year as well. Anime Panda can obviously be found on Art Fight and Toy House but they also have two Tumblr blogs both of which will be linked down below for your convenience. Also their other original character Syra Dawn Seeker gets some of the most immaculate art fight attacks that I've ever seen so that is a very very fun thing to go and check out. Our second to last drawing of this week's Art Fight Adventures belongs to Dahlia Suncat, who's just one of the sweetest, kindest people. Dahlia Suncat drew me an adorable calliope, and I in turn decided to draw her persona Dahlia, but the alternate universe Eclipse version. Regular Dahlia is very energetic and sweet and optimistic. Eclipse Dahlia is snarky and lavish and loves getting revenge. Dahlias are kind of like Eevees. <laughs> they evolve differently depending on their environment and the resources and the attention they are given. But seriously, Eclipse is a result of having a lot of money and never learning the concepts of right or wrong, and also just having an unmatched amount of pride. Also, fun fact, Dahlia hates peanuts and so do I. <laughs> no, but the reason I chose to draw Eclipse Dahlia is exclusively because of the outfit. Um, I love the different fabric tiers, I love the big solar eclipse headdress, I love the different gradients, it's just so pretty. And to achieve that look in traditional mixed media art, is very impressive to me. I have never really used or had like Copic markers, but I've always loved the art of people that do. And Dahlia Suncat does an exceptional job of having smooth gradients without having muddy colors. Most of the designs on Dahlia Suncat's art fight page are of her persona, but I do have to absolutely honorable mention this incredibly compelling character design that I am obsessed with. Please look at Fan Cat. They're a fan, but a cat. They got little whiskers and a cord for a tail. It's very adorable um, and Fancat is allowed to live rent-free in my mind for the rest of eternity. In terms of me and my design decisions regarding this character, I just wanted to go all out. I realized I don't really draw a lot of huge ball gowns very often and I should more because it's a very enjoyable thing to do. I thought I would struggle a lot with the colors because Dahlia Suncat works in very saturated warm color palettes whereas I tend to shy away from a lot of 
brighter colors, but it really wasn't difficult at all. It just blended so well. It suited the eclipse theme wonderfully. And then when it came to her expression and hand movement, I wanted the vibe of, you know, the anime villainess who's very pretty, but also could not care less about your survival rate. And she's just like, oops, teehee, I guess I just effortly destroyed the lives of hundreds of people. Oh well. But I present to you Lady Eclipse Dahlia. It's just a pleasure to draw characters like these because I just, I don't. And again, I should draw more characters like these more often. Sorry, I'm too busy being distracted by drawing muscular ladies in armor. <laughs> but again, all of the credit to this fantastic design goes to the very kind Dahlia Suncat, who of course is on our fight, but you can also follow her on Instagram, which will be linked below, so you can see all of her lovely art throughout the year and not just in July. And for the very last art fight attack I made this week, I drew Diamond Rhodes, a character belonging to Punk X Hazard. This was a revenge piece for the wonderful Inkashi that she drew for me. And in keeping with the theme of my last video, I drew my final art fight character in this video in a completely different style than I usually do. Because because it was the vibe. Occasionally I remember that line art used to be my primary art style and occasionally I find a wonderful character that just it was, he was made to be drawn in ye old classic webtoon style and Diamond Rhodes is definitely that character. So Punk Hazard, who I'm going to respectfully be calling Punk for short, has a really interesting but tragic and heavy story woven between the various characters listed on her art fight page. Currently all of them are related to the main story called Sparks. In this universe, people have gained various powers known as Sparks. Most of the characters on Punk's page have one or two Sparks, but Diamond has three. Wall Runner, which allows him to walk on walls and ceilings. After Image, which allows him to clone himself. And Icebreaker, which allows him to make ice and manipulate it. In general, four is the maximum number of Sparks that a human can naturally have. However, after years of the two giving their service as child soldiers, Diamond's brother, Cole, was taken by the government and experimented on to see how many sparks a human can withstand. They managed to put a total of 15 sparks into coal, but I wouldn't say successfully as coal is now barely human and is just a miserable amalgamation living life in agony. Diamond has named the weapon on his thigh after his brother and knowing that there is no hope for rescuing coal plans to someday end his brother's suffering with the very same weapon. I have no idea if Punk plans to turn this into a book or a webcomic or if, if this all is just in her heart, but holy moly, what a captivating and intriguing story. And that's just one of the characters. He's not even the main character and all of the various characters have their own backstories and motivations. And I feel like you can understand why I chose to do this in this style instead of my usual painty style. The dark plot line, the character design, the character personality, it just lends itself so well to a very specific kind of manga or anime character design. Whenever I do line art, I always enjoy it more than I remember, and it does take a lot less time to render than my usual style. For a very long time, I did actually want to write a webcomic and publish something on webtoon. I've had multiple ideas and outlines. I even completely storyboarded in episode one. I just never went through with it because I would never be happy with the way that I replicated character features panel to panel, and I lose my patience very quickly when drawing these same characters over and over. So, you know, that doesn't really bode well for making webcomics, but maybe one of these days I'll actually stick to it and complete something like that. But speaking of completing, we have finally completed the last character for week four of Art Fight, Punk X Hazard's Diamond Roads. It's a real shame I only have a few minutes per character because there is so much more to Diamond and the rest of the characters in the Spark series, but this video can only be so long, so I guess I'll just have to recommend that you head over to Punk Hazard's art fight page to learn more about the story. And if you want to find more art, they also have a Kara account. And if you just want to be a part of Punk Hazard's shenanigans that are slightly less related to art, they also have a TikTok as well. As always, links are below. And here's our lovely lineup for the week. Eight characters in one week, which is actually insane for me. You don't understand. I have been doing so many wrist stretches and spending a lot of time in a wrist brace. Art fight is like a carpal tunnel speed run and I am not taking chances this year. Now, despite eight characters being done this week, I do have over 20 characters.
character is waiting for revenge is. And at this point, I mean, never say never, but I really don't think I can revenge all of them unless I start doing uncolored or flat colored sketches instead. But I promise you, I will revenge as many as I can in these last few days. Even if I can't revenge them all, I will be sharing all of the art that I receive in videos so we can at least properly appreciate the effort that each of these amazing artists have put into these drawings. But we gotta go fast because this is already a very long video by my standards, so let's look at the art I received. Number one, Tonic by Sheep Dundee. I think I briefly mentioned this one in last week's video, and here it is in all its beautiful glory. I love the cat and mouse theme, the lighting is gorgeous, and I always love a good use of halftones in art. It's both in the coat and also the potion. It just, it's such good texture. Thank you so much, Sheep Dundee, for the second attack. Number two, we have just the dreamiest calliope drawn by Radioactive Clown, which totally unrelated to the art. What a good username. Good job, Radioactive Clown. But her outfit, the little patterns in her corset, the reflection, the glow of the light. I wish my lighting looked half this good in any of my drawings. Thank you so much, Radioactive Clown. Number three, a very frilly calliope with the cutest pink lacy parasol. She looks like a strawberry cupcake here, which is exactly the vibe. Lone Fry absolutely nailed it, and it's gorgeous. I love Lone Fry's art style. It's so dynamic and warm and soft. Such good shapes. It's like cotton candy, but as art, which I mean in the best way. So thank you so much, Lone Fry. Number four, we have another calliope drawn by Triss. Even though it's very different from Lone Fry's calliope, it's still very much the correct vibe. We love calliope. She's a multi-dimensional queen. Anyways, this really captures the cleric slash saintess side of her very well, especially with the white dress and the gorgeous ceremonial looking dagger. Thank you so much, Triss for the lovely art. Number five is the art from Eridani Midna, who I'm mutuals with on Instagram. They have such a pretty art style and just check this dynamic, shapey Cleo out. The lighting, the pose, the understanding of color, it is so good. I love the way that they kept the moon and star shapes in the whirlwind of magic. It is so beautiful. Thank you so, so very much, Eridani Midna, for all of your beautiful art and all of your very kind support. Number six, we have another beautiful tonic piece, this time drawn by you user Sony TV. I love the decision to use the textured brush and the way Tonic's face is rendered, and I mean this genuinely in the best way. It is so properly scrungly, as any art made of Tonic should be. I love the title of the piece too. It's called Don't Worry She Doesn't Bite. That's amazing. Thank you so, so much, Sony TV. Number seven is another gorgeous drawing of Calliope done by Salmon Lee. I love all art of all of my characters, but there is something so special about receiving traditional art, knowing that someone out there has made a physical physical drawing of my character. I love the way the colors are blended. I love the dress. I love everything about this. So thank you so much, Salmon Lee. Number eight is the aforementioned second attack from Surrealism's Finest, a full body Isaguin drawing that is so perfect in every way. Isaguin looks like she's ready to end your life at any moment, which is exactly how she should look. She does look nearly 24 seven. Can we just take a moment to appreciate the clean, beautifully colored line art that Surrealism's Finest just keeps bringing back to the table it's amazing. Thank you for another beautiful attack. Number nine is Fing drawn by Mango Sprango, which may I say, another banger of a username. The colors in this piece are so lovely. He just has such a wholesome and happy expression on his face. It's so perfect. Who needs body language when you're Mango Sprango drawing these cute, perfectly on target expressions for Fing? Thank you so much, Mango Sprango. I love it. Number 10 is the second mass attack I have been a part of this year. This one is done by Smiley Daily and Stop. Look at this Fing plushie. Marketable. Let's get the rights from Smiley Daily immediately and start mass producing Fing plushies. Uh, no, but genuinely, this art is incredible. The line art is so good, and look at his little eyes. He looks so determined. Thank you so much, Smiley Daily. Number 11 is an Isaguin from Marshmallow Cat. I'm so glad that Isaguin is getting so much love this year. Uh, she's often the least popular of the trio, so it really warms my heart that she's getting a lot of solo airtime this year. And Marshmallow Cat did a beautiful job, very clean line art, and I am obsessed with the green details in her lashes. It's just so pretty. Thank you so much, Marshmallow Cat. Number 12, I literally gasped when I saw this. It's art layered in art, layered in art. All the art I've received is amazing, but specifically the people who draw Cleo always go so hard. This was done by longtime supporter of the channel, So Chaotic Squid God. I don't normally get to see their painting style, so this was an absolute mm, treat for my eyeballs. Uh, this piece was inspired by Klimt, Sonia Delani. I could go on and on about this piece, but truly thank you so much. It is, it is gorgeous. It's amazing. And last but absolutely not least, number 13, 
and Kashti drawn by Dumb Cola. The lighting, the expression, the background is all insane, but most of all, I just want to take a moment to appreciate the color theory in this piece. Look at those greens, the reds, the purples. I wish my color theory was this good. Holy moly, thank you so much, Dumb Cola. Oh, okay. That is so many, and I'm still actively receiving more pieces this week. Literally three more pieces came in while I was preparing this video, but since week five is technically not a full week, um, I'm gonna space it out a bit and hopefully uh, that works a little better for next week's video. I, I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea how I'm gonna revenge everyone. I could do a bunch of sketches, but also you all deserve beautiful, fully rendered pieces in return. But genuinely, thank you all so much for the love. As worried about revenge everyone as I am, this is genuinely such a wonderful problem to have. If one thing is for sure, I know I'm gonna try and do my best, but what my best is going to be next week? Well, who knows? Not me. Oh.